Well, hello everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I want to welcome you to another live stream of Let Us Reason. I want to say good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. We are so excited, of course, to have with us our dear brother, Dr. Jay Smith. And today's topic, I'm, I'm certain many of you will find it to be intriguing and interesting. And I've already been exposed to parts of this, um, you know, at least a month ago when myself and Dr. Jay were at our studios. We recorded a number of videos on this topic related to the origin of the Quran. As you know, uh, Dr. J has been going after the uh, the place, the book, the man, and uh, this time we are going to take a, a closer look or a glimpse, if you wish, at the book and the connection between the Aramaic language and the origin of Islam, uh, and in this case, the Quran, I should say, and believe it or not, the fact that what we, what he will uh, refer to as the Proto-Quran is going to uh, put the spotlight on our Lord Jesus Christ. And with that in mind, of course, uh, let us uh, now ask our dear brother to join us. And uh, we are looking forward, of course, to the material that he's going to share with us. Uh, Dr. J, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. I know it's kind of late where you're at. But we always appreciate you and appreciate the interesting material, of course, that you present to your audience and ours as well. Well, thank you, Al Fadi. Thanks for having me on. Uh, listen, uh, you get any time you want me to come on board, I'll be there. It uh, doesn't matter what time of the morning. In this case, we're early morning uh, on the East Coast. You're at a different time, uh, the period a little bit later. You, we are your future. But talking about the future, this is. Um, I, I think what we're bringing up tonight in this program, and certainly this material, I think is going to be groundbreaking in the future. This is coming out of primarily the German school. Now, why did I say the German school? Because the Germans have been working on this probably longer than anybody else. And those of us in the English-speaking world really haven't really heard much about it or haven't either paid attention to it, or if we have, we've dismissed it because... We don't understand it or we don't want to come to the conclusions that this new research will force us to. So you can see why there's a reticence in the West, the English speaking West, because Germany is the West, to really uh, take uh, I, I, to take heed or to take it seriously. And that's unfortunate. Nonetheless, the Germans have just been moving uh, lightning speed ahead of the rest of us. And so it was only because of Thomas Alexander. You know him now. You've met him. Thomas Alexander, who is a German himself, who a number of months ago was writing on my Fander films. And he was writing amazing uh, descriptions and uh, coming up with questions and coming up with categories that uh, in the description not the description, sorry, the comments on the YouTube. You know, you have them on yours as well. I don't know if you uh, take time to look at the comments. I do. I love to look at the comments on my videos. And when you look at the comments, you pick up people that are astute. You pick up people that know their material. And you especially pick up people that are asking the right questions and are engaging in the right discussions. And I love it when I pick up someone like Thomas. And I did so. And I said, get in contact with me. Who are you? I had no idea he was German. I didn't know who he was. His name was Thomas. Well, that's a common name. And he didn't. He contacted me and he started saying, you're getting some of this right. And the people you're bringing on board are really pretty clever. You've got Mel, who's doing a great job. And you've got to this guy, Odin, who is, you know, uh, there's an awful lot of, the guy has, knows his material and has such a breadth of knowledge. He says, but there's some areas that you are failing in and you're not really picking up and you're not keep, uh, you're not aware of, especially when it comes to the Quran, especially when it comes to the Quran. That's why I'm wearing brown tonight, because this is the Quran material. And I said, well, well OK, what is it? Tell me. So I, I said, would you be willing to put your face in front of the camera, which he had never done before? And he thought about it for a while, came back fine. He says, yeah, listen, if I'm going to be uh, introducing this to you, it doesn't make sense if I keep my not, if I don't have my face there. There's nothing here that's incriminating. There's nothing here that's hateful. Uh, there's nothing here that's Islamophobic. This is just straight textual criticism. That's what it was, textual criticism. Now, Al-Fadi, that's what you're doing. Your doctoral thesis is on this, isn't it? You're using textual criticism. What 
Uh, but let me, before we even get out, because that's a big word, what does that mean to you, Al Fadi, textual criticism? Well, I mean, obviously, textual criticism in general, it's the attempt to try to discover the original script, the original copy. Uh, so in, in the case of the New Testament, for instance, we know we have different families of manuscripts. So can we really know what was the original writing of the apostles? Uh, you know, what did Paul actually write? Is what we have today exactly what Paul wrote? And uh, obviously, the more evidence you have and the more comparisons and analysis you have of wording and sentence structure and many other factors, of course, can lead uh, scholars to believe that the original writings uh, is so close to what we have and oftentimes it's a high percentage it's, i think it's like 97 or 98 uh, percent uh, you know of what the authors wrote is what we have in our hand today so it's really an attempt to go back to the original writing in the case of the quran of course this hasn't been done to that extent right so that's what we're trying to do now could we go back and find the original, let's say, writing of this book called the Quran? And obviously, you have to wrestle now with a period of time that is so um, complicated, so confusing. You have about 200 to 300 years period uh, between what is known as the standard Islamic narrative, traditionally, when the Quran was revealed, to what we find later as the Quran becoming more of a fixed uh, text, if you wish. So I'm focusing on the fluidity of that period. What happened? And can we attempt, at least if possible, to go back as early as possible to the original writing itself? Isn't it interesting when I asked you the question, how would you define textual criticism? The only example you could give me was the New Testament immediately you defaulted back to the New Testament because really textual criticism has matured, has really been, well, it just wasn't created on the New Testament. It's just, it's gone by leaps and bounds because of all the enormous amount of doctoral research. They re for almost 150 to, oh, I would say even 200 years, since the 1800s, they have done textual analysis of the New Testament and of the Old Testament, looking at the codicology, looking at the manuscripts, looking at all the, 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 how the Greek language changed, what, where were the earliest fragments, how can we date them? All of this has really matured these, this whole textual process uh, over the last 200 years because of the New Testament. But as you said at the very ending, this hasn't really been done to the Quran. And that's why we are now changing our gear, looking, putting our focus onto the Quran itself. And we're not at all interested in the Islamic traditions, the standard Islamic narrative, because as you say, what the standard Islamic narrative has told us about the Quran is two to 300 years out of date. And what they've told us about the Quran in the 7th century, though they're writing this in the 9th and 10th century, have made mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake. After, and the reason you can see that is because it doesn't make sense. The Quran they're talking about, this proto-Quran, this Ur-Quran, this archetype that they always refer to, they call the Uthmanic recension. And they give a name to it. And it's a person who was ruling between six uh, 46 to 656, but between around 650 to 652, he was the one that created the Quran as we have today. That's the standard Islamic narrative. And you heard it, I've heard it, everybody's heard it. And this was being created in Medina, in the Hijaz, in that central part of Arabia, where there's a desert and there's nothing there. And as we've said over and over again, you and I have mentioned this. I mean, so many people are saying this now. If there's no water, there is no food. If there's no food, there are no people, there are no people, there are no towns, there are no towns, there's no cities, there is no civilization. And if there's no civilization, then there is no need, there is no way you're going to have a Ur Quran or a proto Quran. Quran created in such a desert environment. Yes, there are oases there uh, that have hamlets, but you don't create an entire civilization and you don't create an entire language and you don't create an entire set of dialects, multiple dialects in little hamlets of just a few hundred people in just 22 years. That's the problem. So what the Germans have been doing and what they have said is, well, 
you've got to put this all together. You need to look and see what's happening politically. You need to see what's happening theologically. You need to see what is happening with the text itself, because the text itself reflects what's happening both politically and theologically. You can't divorce yourself from that in the seventh century. Not today. Today, today we don't have politics and impacting on our theology. Well, not as much. But in the seventh century, Everything you wrote and everything you said was not only was a theological dictum, it was taken by the politics of the day, and it became their, uh, their opus operandi. Everything they did was because of their God. Everything they talked about was because of who they represented. Their coins show this. The, the, uh, the mosaics on the walls of their palaces show this. You can see it all on their scripts and their manuscripts. Everything was theologically induced. And so to what the Germans have been saying is to understand how where this proto-Quran is, throw away this assumption that it was written by a man named Uthman, since that there was no Medina and Mecca, certainly no Mecca. There was a Yathrib, but nothing of really import or importance down that far south. You need to go to Damascus. You need to go to places like Stesiphon, which is today Baghdad. You need to go to Jordan. You need to stay up in the north because that's where the civilizations are. That is where the religious discussions were happening. And that is where Christianity was in control. And it was in control all through the 7th and up into the 8th century. There was no Islam in the 7th century. There were no Muslims anywhere in the 7th century. We don't have any Quran, Arabic Quran, that uh, that is anywhere close to the one I have here. This one I always put up, this little Quran. This, this did not exist in the 7th century. Now, how do I prove that? Well, just go back to the 7th century. And that's what the Germans have been doing. They've been going back to the 7th century. And they've been looking at the theological text of that time and that place and those specific days. And what have they found? Well, lo and behold, they have found what we all know. Nobody has ever doubted this. We've always known this, that the language of that day was Aramaic. All your liturgy was done in Aramaic. All your hymns, all your homilies, these are preachings, these are sermons, were done in Aramaic. Why? Because Everybody in that area were Christians or Jews or pagans, not Muslims. Oh, there were Zoroastrians in the east. Yeah, we know that in Persia, what is today Iran, parts of Iraq. But everything else was Christian. Now, there were many different variations of Christianity, and you had your Trinitarians and you had your anti-Trinitarians. I'm just being as simple as possible. There were many in between with many different juxtapositions. There was a real soup that was percolating there in the East. And that's why when Heraclius destroys the Sassanians in 622 and then decides to leave the area because he was having so much problem over in the West on his Western borders, he then pretty much gave up on what he had destroyed and left it to the Arabs that he had now freed. Those Arabs were almost all Christians. A sprinkling of Jews and a sprinkling of some Zoroastrians, which were still a, a, a carryover from the Sassanid period, but mostly Christians. And certainly in the cities, they were Christian. And in the cities, the large cities like Stesiphon, like Damascus, like Petra, like even further east, uh, uh, Isfahan and these other areas, and even way up in Merv and Turkmenistan, these cities had bishops. Bishops are Christians. And when you have bishops who are Christians, what do you think, what language would they have used? Some used Greek, but most of them used Aramaic. And they had liturgy, and they had hymns, and they had homilies. And that's why when you want to look at the Quran, if the Quran was written in the 7th century, you need to go to the 7th century and you need to look at the texts that were there. And these texts are there. But who has done that? Have you done that, Al-Fadi? Have I done that? Have any of your professors done that? No. Only the Germans have done this. The Germans and some French too, like Guillaume D. and Galez. They have done it but they kept it in French and they kept it in German. So we couldn't understand it. Well, here's the irony of it. 
I actually knew about this, but I didn't even know what I was looking at. See, back, let's go back to the last century. Let's go back to 1970. In 1970, there was a scholar who was there in Germany, and he was looking at these texts uh, from the 7th century. He was also looking at the Quran, and he was coming to places like chapter 23, and he was coming to places like chapter 70, surah 23, surah 70. Uh, he was looking and said, hold on a minute. I've seen this text. These are huge. These are beautiful. The poetry that's in the Quran, these gorgeous poems that are in the Quran, they are there. They are there. They are there. And he said, I've seen these before. So he decided to write his doctoral thesis there in Germany. And he wrote it uh, in 1970. And he was given the highest grade you can get in Germany. It was given the grade of opus eximium. Eximium. I don't know exactly how to, it's Latin. It's opus eximium. He was given opus eximium, which is as high as you can get in Germany. You can't get a higher grade than that for his thesis. Once you get ex, uh, ex, um, opus eximium, you are given a professorship in any university you want in Germany. It's almost like a, uh, an automatic professorship. But he didn't get a professorship. And two years later, in 1972, he was thrown out of the university and he was thrown into obscurity, where he remained for 30 years. 30 years. Now, interestingly, I, I was in Germany in 1991 to go visit Dr. Gerd Prynne. You know who Dr. Gerd Prynne, he's part of the Inada group. He's, again, another German scholar. And his area of expertise is what you're studying, the Sana manuscript. He was one of the ones, the few, uh, Dr. von Bothmer, Dr. Oleg, Dr. Gerd Prynne, they were flown down in 1981 to look at this manuscript that had been discovered there uh, in the Sana Mosque, uh, in, uh, in one of, uh, in, in the... the the crawl space up there above the dome. Uh, and nobody, when they found it, they didn't know how to read these manuscripts that had fallen to the ground when they opened up a trap door. And they were, the reason they didn't know how to read it because it had no diacritical marks. It had no dots, no vowels, no, no harakat, no ijams, none of these. And so uh, they flew down, Dr. Gerd Prynne, Dr. Von Bothmer, Dr. Oleg, and uh, to look at this text. And of course, they saw immediately what was going on here because these are three of the major scholars on the, uh, what we know as the the primary the uh, ar the archaic arabic 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 from the seventh century which only had about 16 letters didn't have any dots and vowels at that early and so they flew down there they looked at them they took pictures of them put them onto microfilms which were then confiscated by the government because they realized that there was a problem here well i wanted to see dr garrett print because this is now the 1990s quite a few years later they have been finally given their microfilms back in 19 i think 1997 they have been given their microfilms back and uh, i wanted to go see him in germany i went into his house and he wanted to introduce me to this man named dr gunther luling i didn't know who this guy was he said, we'd like to introduce you to him. Uh, we would like to have lunch with you, and he'd like to talk to you. And uh, so he and his wife had us come to their house, and uh, we sat down with him. And he said, um, he gave us the story, but he didn't give us the whole story. He just said that he had written a doctoral thesis, and uh, that. And I didn't know about him being thrown into obscurity at the time. He didn't. He was very humble. He didn't talk about it. Uh, remember, he'd now been going on 30 years by the time I met him. And uh, he, I said, well, what did you do with your, and what was your thesis about? And he says, well, actually, it was about, the looking at these beautiful poems in the Quran in Arabic and finding out that actually if you took off the dots and you took off the vowels and just went back to the Razum, the consonantal text, you can actually find that they, these are earlier texts, but not in Arabic, in Aramaic. These were hymns in Aramaic written in the 5th, the 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries, some of them by Ephraim in the 4th century, and I recognize him because I have them right here in Aramaic. And so he wrote this thesis. And I said, well, where is your thesis? And he said, well, it's right here. And he showed it to me. It was all written there. 30 years old, almost, almost coming on 30 years, 25 to 30 years. It was just in, in German, obviously, written in, uh, on a, a typewritten copy. And I said, what do you plan to do with that? And I didn't really think through uh, the imprint um, uh, of what I was saying. He said, well, could uh, would you like to, uh, and he asked me would you be able to get this translated into english i said certainly he said well here i've already translated into english so he showed us the english copy we took it back to london and i said listen uh, we'd like to get this 
uh, brought down to layman's terminology because if you know anything about academic German, Al-Fadi, when you have one sentence, it could be 400 words long. And uh, that you try to begin the sentence, and by the time you end the sentence, you can't remember what the beginning of the sentence was alike. So we wanted to get it down and break it down so it could be usable and, of course, understandable. Now, that was, I think, 1999. By 2003, then, he then took it and got it published in India. He couldn't get it published in Germany, obviously, so he got it published in India, and here it is. This is it. I think you've got a copy of this, don't you? Yes, I have a copy at least of two of these books that you are going to uh, uh, showcase right now. This is one of them. It's called A Challenge to Islam for Reformation, which is a terrible title. I wish he hadn't used that title. title that is important. This is the title right here. Let me just read it to you. It says, The Rediscovery and Reliable Reconstruction of a Comprehensive Pre-Islamic Christian Hymn Hidden in the Quran Under Earliest Islamic Reinterpretations. So basically what he's saying is much of this Ur-Quran, this archetype, this proto-Quran is made up of Christian hymns. Well, that's where I lost contact with him because once he had it published, I had done my work and I left. And so we can, went and I didn't really think about him, didn't hear about him, didn't know what had happened to him. I didn't really keep in touch with him because then everything else broke loose because of 9-11. And of course, once 9-11 had, it changed all of our ministries and we all moved into other many different areas and I left the whole study that I had been doing on the Quran at that time. And it wasn't until I met Thomas a few months ago when Thomas started talking to me about this guy and mentioned, and do you know, that English translation that got translated and sent and was published in India and now is all over the world, that resurrected him. It resurrected him. So by the time he died in 2014, he was finally given the accolades that he should have had deserved way back in 1970. We're talking about we're talking about 40 years, 45 years later, we find fine before finally getting the accolades he deserved. Now, fortunately, that's because we got what was German brought it into English. Because of what Gunther Lunig did, and because of, of, of the impact. Christoph Luxemburg then decided to follow suit. And Christoph Luxemburg also knows Syriac. And so he was also a Syriac scholar, another German, though he's from a Lebanese background. So he knows Syriac. And he decided to go and try to unpack what we call the dark passages of the Quran. These are about 25% of the Quran is just not understandable. Uh, the scholars don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to unpack it. They don't understand it. And because of that, uh, they have just left it alone. And you know this, and I know this, and there's lots of you. Know, look at those letters before each one of those lam, alif, mim. What are they doing before the uh, before the, 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 the chapters of the Quran, the different surahs? We don't know what they're there for. No one knows what they're there for. They're still there, but no one has really unpacked them until Christoph Luxemburg decided he's going to do what... Gunther Luling did, but he's going to be a little bit more sophisticated and go into it in more depth. And so what he did, he went through what we call a seven-step process, a seven different layers of pulling back and unpacking the what's in front of him. Because these are, because these are, uh, these, uh, 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 these dark passages are not understandable, we wanted to find out how to understand them. So he went through the, I'm going to go through the seven process. They're very simple to understand. And I. this is basically classic textual criticism. This is what every textual analysis or any textual critic should do with any piece of uh, a piece of artifact or piece of literature that is not understandable, that has been translated from one language to the other. And this is what you do. What do you do the first thing? Well, the first thing you do is you go back and you try to find a, an understanding of the text you're looking back. So you go back to Al uh, Tabari in the 10th century, and you look at his tafsir. That's the first thing he did. So he started with the commentaries. Al Tabari is the best because Al Tabari takes everything and puts it all together and lets the reader come to their own conclusion. And he did this before 923. So we're talking about the 10th century, which is quite late because you're talking about a text that was written in the 7th century, now being trying to understand it in the 10th century. So you're not going to get too much that will help you understand it there. So he didn't get too far with that. So the next step, number two, he then went to the what they call the Lisan al-Arab, which is the tongue of Arabs, which is the Arabic dictionary put together by Ibn Manzur in 1290. To look at words. 
Look at the Arab words. See if you can understand the words and then look at the context. Do that. Does that make sense? That helped a bit, one or two things, but still an awful lot just did, still didn't make sense. So the third thing he did was he then went to the Aramaic and he looked for what he called homonymous or synonymous roots uh, uh, in Aramaic, but had would have different meanings. So the same roots in the Arabic and the Aramaic, because they're very similar, Arabic comes and comes out. They're both uh, uh, Semitic languages, so they have similar roots. And by doing that, he was able to find quite a few different synonymous roots in Aramaic. So he knew he was onto something because he had already been made aware of this by Gunther Luling beforehand. So he knew if he went back to the Aramaic, he could do what Gunther Luling had done with the hymns he was now doing with these dark passages. Number four, then, he then took off all the diacritics, all the dots, the five dots and the three vowels, but mostly the dots. He just took them away and then tried to rearrange them with other dots and so, see what would have happened. And that helped him a little bit. That was the fourth thing. And then he went to the Aramaic roots of using different diacritics. So he then reimposed the diacritics in the Aramaic text to see if that would help him. And he found stunned. He started to find all kinds of new words that made sense in the context of the verses that they're in. He started unpacking a whole slew of them by going back to the Aramaic and reimposing the dots that had been Arabic dots. He put the Aramaic ones. Number six, then, he then tried to retranslate the Arabic words back into the Aramaic using the semantics of the Syro Aramaic word. Basically, he just did what everybody should do whenever you're translating reverse the process back from Arabic, Arabic back to the Aramaic. The assumption, of course, is that it came from Aramaic to begin with. But you have to start with that assumption to be able to do even do that exercise, which nobody really can do. No one has done this in the Arabic speaking word because how many. Arab speakers, you know, speak Aramaic. Very few. Th that's true. At least in, in my sphere, yes. I mean, there is at least uh, two people that I met in the past that speak it. One actually wrote uh, a book uh, that you have. Yeah. This guy right here. Right. And why does he speak Aramaic? Because this is his language. He is Aramaic speaking, but they're almost all Christians. See, Arabs or Muslims do not speak Aramaic. Why would they? It's a Christian language. So there'd be no reason to. And there has never been any need to because everybody's just assumed Arabic is the original language. This is the language that's in heaven. This is the eternal Quran, always written in Arabic, has never been written in any other language. If you come with that viewpoint... And that blinkered you point, that narrowed view of the Quran, which every Muslim has come with, which every Western caller has come with, which everybody has been told, including you, myself, all of my teaching, all of my training has told me that Arabic has always existed. It is the eternal language. It exists on those eternal tablets. That's endemic to the Quran. It's in chapter 85, verse 22 that God would protect from, from being changed. That's in chapter 15, verse 9, that you cannot take one word or one sentence and change it. No human has the possibility to change it. That's in chapter 10, verse 15, and chapter 18, verse 27. So it's endemic to the Quran itself. The Quran makes these claims. If the Quran makes these claims, nobody, nobody is going to look elsewhere. There's no reason to look elsewhere because Arabic is God's holy language. It has is his eternal language. It has always existed on those eternal taps. Can you then see why what Gunther Luling and Christoph Luxemburg were suggesting shuts everything down? Because this is starting from a completely different presupposition. Nobody has dared to even suggest that maybe the Ur-Quran, maybe the Proto-Quran wasn't Arabic. Maybe. It never began as Arabic. So then he had one more step to go, and this is the seventh step. So the seventh step was to find the lost meanings of Arab words using 10th century Syro-Aramaic lexicon. So he went back, instead of losing, using Arabic lexicons, he used Aramaic lexicons. Once he had come to the seventh layer, he was able to reproduce the entire, all of this entire what we call as dark passages, this 25% that no one was able to reproduce. Now, that was done in around 2000, uh, the year 2000. So 22 years ago, that happened. And this book has been out for 22 years. But 
hold on a minute. Why haven't we picked up on this? Why haven't I picked up on it? Why? I was part of the discussion way back in the 1990s and I didn't even think about it. I was because I didn't, I wasn't prepared to change my presuppositions. No one around me was prepared. In the English speaking world, we haven't been prepared for this. But the Germans were way ahead there. That's why they're so far ahead. And that's why we've got to wake up to what's been going on. So this has been around since 1970, Al Fadi. Now that's happened, those two books. Now I just want to give you a third book, and you've already mentioned it. And this is by Gabriel Salma called The Quran Misinterpreted, Mistranslated, and Misread The Aramaic Language of the Quran. Here's what's fascinating. What he has done and what he's saying is, listen, you people, we're the Aramaic speakers. We've been speaking Aramaic for centuries. We understand the Quran because where do you think it came from? It came from us. But no one has been listening to us. No one has been paying attention until Gunther Luning came upon it by accident. And then, of course, Luxembourg took what Gunther Luning did and expanded upon it. But see, they're not native Aramaic speakers. Gabriel Sama is, and almost all of the ones we're going to have to go back to are the original Aramaic speakers. Because if you want to find out what the Quran is, you need to ask what these men have found. And this is what they're telling us. What they're saying is all of this material. Now, we're not talking about all the Quran. Please, let, don't, don't misquote me on this. They're not saying all the Quran. Because the Quran that we have today is a product of the Abbasid the Abbasid period from 749 and later. The proto Quran is what I'm talking about, the original parts of the Quran, the beautiful poetry, most of these theological themes, most of the discussions, most of the stories about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the, the references to Jesus, all of these stories that we call our biblical stories are and have antecedents. And almost all of those antecedents are either Jewish or they're Christian Aramaic or they're Syriac Aramaic or Nabataean Aramaic. They are either lectionaries or they're homilies, which are preaching, preaching events, or they are hymns with explanations by these teachers who are trying to teach students on how they are to use these hymns and what they're to say. Now, here's what's interesting. With that in mind, can you see what this now says about the Quran? Well, obviously, you can see where this is going. Remember when I came on your show about a month ago, a little over a month ago, and we um, introduced some of the, we call them sin sifters. These are the ones that put in the sift and they find out what comes out underneath. You, know, you find it, you put in there. So what we have been doing and what Gunther Luling has been doing and what uh, Christoph Luxemburg doing. He's sticking, they're sticking the Quran into here. And what they do when they sift it through, what they're finding that comes out the end, what they original, when they go back to the original text, what they're finding is these lectionaries, these homilies, these preachers, or these teachings, or these sermons, and these hymns are all about Jesus. They're all lectionaries that were liturgy. These are liturgy that are done in the church. You've been to churches where they do this. I've been to churches where they do this. Even today, you have liturgy. It's not scripture itself. This is not scripture, folks. Okay? We're not saying that this is scripture. This is not word for word right out of the Bible. No, these are lectionaries. And what they are tend to be, they are memnonics. Memnonics means that they are memorized texts that follow a theme, and they usually have types of words at the end that are, uh, the, the, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, that, that they rhyme. So they have rhymes so that you can, mem so you can memorize them in catechisms. And to memorize them in catechisms, you need to have rhyming words. So it helps you. Memnonics means be, be able to memorize things. So you have memorizing entire poems so that you can repeat them and then get your, uh, for, uh, by doing that, you get your canon. But that's how you learn your theology. And that's how the church would teach its theology through these hymns, through these lectionaries, and through these preaching, uh, uh, these sermons, or better call them just sermons. So, when they did this, they were doing this because of the need to train the people in the church, the scriptures. But they didn't just give them the scriptures. They gave them these 
lectionaries of liturgy. They gave them these sermons that unpack scripture. And then they gave them these hymns, which are beautiful poetry, so they could sing about the Lord Jesus Christ and know about what his, his salvation and understand what and who he was and what was demanded of them. Let me give you two examples. Open up your Quran. I, I don't know if you have a Quran in front of you, Al Fadi, but do you have one? I have uh, one online if you want me to go to that one. Okay, go up to chapter 23 and let's just show you what we're talking about. Here's okay. an example. This is one actually that I've put up online with Odin. Odin actually um, brought this to my attention and he brought it up because of Guillaume D. Guillaume D is a French scholar who's done much the same thing. And uh, he gives this as uh, these two examples of a, a, a an ex uh, of a beautiful hymn that was written by Ephraim, Saint Ephraim in the fourth century, and so it would have been well known in that part of the world. And when you look at chapter twenty three, look at the first, well, the uh, verses one to eleven. I won't have you read it all the way through, but you can. if you look at verses 1 through 11, and if other people are watching this, open up your Qurans if you have them. And it talks, well, the first five verses talk about the uh, obligations of the believers. So it's for believers. Do you have it in front of you there? Yes, I do. Okay, just read it in English so we can understand it. Verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, and verse 5. But only read the part that's from the Arabic. Don't read the commentaries, okay? Well, I just have the Quran only without commentaries here. Arabic and English. So you want me to read the English? Yeah, but otherwise people won't understand. Right, listen, you can read Arabic, but we're going to sit there befuddled because we most people don't know what you're saying. So read it in English so we can all understand it. All right. Uh, verse 1, successful are the believers, those who are humble in their prayers, those who avoid nonsense, those who work for charity, those who safeguard their chastity. Okay, right there. So there are five things that a believer must do. To be a good right. believer, well, actually, there's four things they must do to be a good believer. One is they must do prayers. Uh, they must not use bad, bad language or evil talk. They must pay their zakat or their tithing. And they must guard their chastity. Okay, so those are the four things the believer does. Now, skip number six and skip number seven and go to verse eight, because this verse is where eight. it continues. Okay, uh, verse eight. eight nine, so eight, nine, ten, and eleven. All right, we'll do the same thing in English. Uh, verse eight: Those who are faithful to their trusts and pledges those who safeguard their prayers these are the inheritors who will inherit paradise wherein they will dwell forever okay now that's the prayer that comes from the fourth century that is word for word just as it is in aramaic but look and at it doesn't have a foreign word al firdaus you know by the way so firdaus okay that's a foreign word and that is actually a word for paradise which comes right. from is it uh, actually that uh, Fidadaus? It comes. It, it comes from Zoroastrian, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, there is. Of course, the Quran is copy and paste uh, without a doubt. So it does have a collection of words in here. But you never know. I mean, uh, it's quite possible that uh, uh, the Zoroastrian borrowed it, or uh, the Christians borrowed it. I mean, uh, you don't know. Uh, I mean, but what we're saying is, it's not an original Arabic word. It's borrowed. Okay. Well, nonetheless. Interestingly, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, jump to verse 8, 9, 10, 11. What about verse 6 and 7? Read now 6 and 7. Okay. So verse 6 says, except... Wait, start with verse 5. Start with verse 5, then read verse 6 and 7. Got it. Verse, uh, you're right. Verse 5 will make it clear, the context. Those who safeguard their chastity except from their spouses or their dependents, for they are free from blame. But whoever seeks anything beyond that, these are the transgressors. Now, hold on okay. a minute. Does that make sense from what you've just read from verse 1 to 5? Uh, you know, if you add verse 5, it's almost like talking about the chastity here. 
uh, you know, like basically not committing uh, adultery or things of that nature or exposing themselves. Uh, so you have to have six and seven to begin to understand what exactly they mean by that. Actually, it bastardizes verse five. It absolutely, heinously destroys the whole notion of what chastity is all about. See, the Christian view of chastity is very clear. One man and one woman, not wives, as it says in verse 6, which is polygamous. And you do not have that which your right hand possesses, which is slaves, women, female slaves of war. That is not chastity. So it's basically so it's, an Islamic theology being inserted here, technically it speaking. It is a bastardization by the Arabic put in by the Abbasids in the 8th century. It does not belong to the original prayer. See, the prayer is a beautiful prayer written for Christians about how you must be believers, you must pray, you must give your zakat, you must not use slanderous word, and you must remain chaste. And then if you do all these things, you will be rewarded in Firdaus, in paradise. Suddenly, verse 6 and 7 are added at a later date and completely adulterate what was, there, what was a beautiful poem about the believers and what is their reward. Can you see how the Arabic completely, I use the word bastardization. I know some people have said, please don't use that word. But actually, if you look up in the dictionary, that's exactly what bastardize means, is to take something that is good and make it bad. They have completely degenerated the entire poem. And why do they do that? Because the Abbasid Arabs believed in polygamy and they believed in sex slaves. And that's why they had to put that in there because you could remain, you had to define what chastity is all about. And I'm saying, is, can you see then how what the Quran has done? The Abbasids have taken what was beautiful. These are beautiful hymns. And what's interesting, if you look at these uh, 11 verses without six and seven, you can show that there's mnemonics used all the way through. So verse one to five are parallel with verse eight to 11. I'm sorry, one to two are parallel with verse 10 and 11 and verses three to five parallels verse eight and nine. That's where the mnemonics is. And you can see that's why it was intended to help you with the memorization. Right, right, right. And, and also, uh, if you look at it, destroys that mnemonics and complain, destroys that pattern, proving that these were added at a later date. And also, in addition to that, you know, verses one, two, three, four, five, and then... Uh, 8, 9, 10, and 11. It makes sense. There is virtues here that are being listed, technically speaking. Virtues and rewards, right. if you hold to these virtues. That's beautiful. And that's what Christianity has always done. These are the things that God demands of us. And if you do these things, if you keep chaste, but chaste has nothing to do with multiple wives and sex slaves. That's what's horrendous, heinous. Now, in chapter 70, it does the very same thing. In chapter 70, verses 25 to 35, from verse 25 to 29, you have the obligations, and then you come to the word chaste. And again, it bastardizes the word chaste in verse 30 and 31, and then it returns to its poetry from verse uh, 32 to 35. These are the rewards. Again, it's much the same hymn that is repeated in chapter 70 with the adulteration that's introduced there on the word chastity. And, you know, the, uh, Guillaume D. has done us a great favor, has done us a great favor, because what he has shown is that these beautiful hymns, these beautiful lectionaries, these beautiful sermons that were meant to make us pure, to keep us pure, to keep us close to God, and also to follow his example, have been taken and they have been, oh, they just been adulterated with this horrendous view of women, and this horrendous view of families, and this horrendous view of marriage. And that's why we need to take these hymns, put them through the sifter, and get back these uh, not hymns. They're not hymns in, in uh, Surah 23. We need to take what's in Surah 23 and Surah 70 and find out what's coming out the other end, what we're going to see, get them back to its original text. Now, what's interesting, Gunther, um, uh, Christoph Luling did much the same thing with the references in chapter 56 and chapter 50. Five and chapters, uh, uh, I think it's 76. I don't, we don't have time to unpack it because I see we only have 50 minutes to go and I have a, a number of things yet to say. But he wanted to see what 
the original text was for paradise. Now, you know where I'm going with this, Alfari, because you've talked about it. We've talked about it before. When he went back and looked at and unpacked what was in paradise, waiting for men, these huris. And these huris are women who are pure, who have beautiful translucent skin, and they have firm breasts, and this is what's waiting for them. When you put it into the Aramaic, Back like he did, following the seven-step process of unpeeling it, unpeeling it, unpeeling it, unpeeling it. Back until he went through the seven steps, he found that this is not anything to do with women at all. These huris are actually grapes, bunches of grapes that have translucent skin as grape do. The best grape, the fruit, the, the best, most succulent grapes are those with firm, that are firm and translucent skin. And it was describing grapes, not women. What's interesting... You, they better be delicious grapes for people to die for them. <laughs> Mel, Mel uh, sent me a picture from the 4th century uh, of a mosaic in, in a church. Uh, and it's a picture of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in heaven. And they're welcoming the believers as they're coming into heaven. And guess what they're giving them as they're coming into heaven? Grapes. Bunches of grapes. That's in the fourth century. They're giving them grapes in the fourth century, which is exactly what these, these verses are about. These hoodies are grapes. They're not women. Again, it's adulterated, a beautiful, really, the fruit of heaven. The fruit of heaven are grapes. We don't go to heaven to get women. We go to heaven to meet Jesus. We go to heaven to meet Jesus. And of course, if you think about it, uh, uh, Jay, uh, the reason why there's grape, grape, that's where you get wine. And Jesus was talking about he's not going to drink a cup of wine until uh, the, the wedding feast in heaven. So, so it's symbolic when they're giving grapes. That's the intent here behind it. That's the intent behind it. Now, in saying this, there has been some kickback. There has been some pushback. Uh, and Angelica Neuwirth and uh, Francois de Blois, de Blois are probably the two who have tried their most to, to try to shut Luxembourg down. And, of course, they're not dealing with Luling in Norman because he's no longer living. Uh, and so you can't really confront somebody who's dead. So they've really been confronting him. And here's what's interesting. Look at their analysis of why they're shutting him down. They're not using any textual criticism to shut him down. They're not going through and, act, and analyzing the seven-step process that Christoph Luxemburg went to to get to his conclusions. If you're going to shut somebody down, you should really shut down their critical analysis, their textual criticism, right? Isn't that the way you shut them down? Show that there's fallacy or there's falsehoods or they have not applied it. What they're doing is that they're confronting his interpretation and say, we don't like your interpretation. We don't like your conclusions. Well, they have all the right to say that. They may not like their con his conclusion. They may not even like the way he interpret or translated one word. That is fine. Then, And that's as much as they have been able to do. They have not looked at his textual critical analysis and looked at the edifice that he used to come to his conclusions. What's interesting, the most common criticism against Christoph, Luling, uh, Christoph Luxemburg is that his conclusions will upset Muslims unnecessarily. Now, is that a valid criticism? Interestingly, uh, Thomas Alexander was saying that if someone like Francois de Blois, who's probably been the most virulent against Christoph Luxemburg, has does not have the academic credentials that Christoph Luxemburg has or Gunther Lulling, and he has never done any textual analysis, almost his entire ethos against Christoph Luxemburg is ad hominem. In other words, attacking his character. Now, we know exactly what's going on here. Al-Fadi, we get our character attacked. Listen, I've been in this field for 40 years. I know exactly what happens when they don't like what you say. They don't go to what you're saying. They don't unpack how you come to your conclusions. They don't even go to the analysis or the critical analysis that you're using to even apply those conclusions. They just attack your character all the time, all the time. One of the most common attacks I get is, how are you talking about the Quran when you don't know fluent Arabic? Well, that's why I have Al-Fadi along with me, because he does know fluent Arabic. But even then, you still get attacked. Can you see what's interesting? If this is the, if this is the conclusion, if this is what they're finding, can you see even this attack they can't use us anymore? Because who cares if we don't know the Arabic? The Quran, in its original form, the proto-Quran, had nothing to do with Arabic. 
In fact, it's Arabic that has adulterated it. It's the Arabic that has bastard. Excuse my English, but that's the best word to use. I don't know what better ways to say it. It is the Arabic that has bastardized what was altogether a beautiful, beautiful hymns, beautiful lectionaries, beautiful sermons about our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to bring people home. I want to get them back to yeah. the original Aramaic. Speaking of that, we have uh, here a, uh, a lady by the name of Amina Talitha. She's saying uh, she she wants to come home and she just doesn't know how to do it. And I've been uh, noticing the, her comments right now. So we want to make sure that we encourage her to pray and accept Jesus as Lord, because she's saying the material you're sharing has opened her eyes. Well, Amina, listen, there is only way one way to come home, and that is you just have to pray. Just that's the Lord into your life. It as simple as that. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to do any ablutions. You don't have to go to the church and wash yourself clean. You can do it right where you are. And the Lord will come and enter your life and he will just, well, that's the beauty of it. Look at the hundreds who have come to the Lord because they have realized that the Quran, Muhammad, Mecca, all these are nothing more than fraudulent they have not there is no man named muhammad that we can find who lived in a place called mecca who received a book called the quran be in the seventh century in a 22 year period we just can't find it not anywhere but what i love about this whole exercise and amina i hope you're listening because this is for you this is for all of you who are listening this exercise takes it back to its original text and we're to do that remember what al fadi said at the very beginning of this hour he said, to understand the text, you want to go and see what the author wrote. You want to see what the author intention was. That's called proper exegesis. I say Jesus is to impose upon the text what you want, which is exactly what the Arabs did, what the Abbasids did after 749. They imposed on these lectionaries, on these hymns, on these sermons, which were written in the 5th, 6th, and 7th century, they imposed their Arabic read. Now, here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to show you there are three different stages that the Quran has gone through. And we're going to, and this is fascinating because everybody needs to pay attention to this. Once you take what is beautiful about Jesus, about Christ, about what how, a pure living, about being chaste, and the rewards for those who are pure and give their tithe and, and who also remain chaste and uh, pray to God and keep con con communication with God, their reward will be in heaven with him again. We can't wait to get there, not for waiting for some women to be there, or look, we're looking for grapes to be there. I can't wait to eat those grapes. But what's beautiful about all of this, once you take that kind of text, that those beautiful hymns and those sermons, and you look at them and you realize you don't speak Aramaic. See, those who actually put the Quran together in the 8th and 9th century later on didn't know Aramaic. Why? Because of Abd al-Malik. Abd al-Malik is the one that introduced Arabic as the lingua franca for the whole area. He is the one that actually took it, took these writings, and he was anti-Trinitarian. He did not believe in the Trinity. He was a Christian. Listen, I think we are pretty well know that he was a Christian. And he was writing these anti-Trinitarian references. He was attacking the Christians. Joe from Red Judaism believes he was attacking the Jews at that same point. That's why he built the Dome of the Rock right on the Temple Mount, the Holy of Holies for all the Jews at that time. But what was fascinating, he was still a Christian. He still believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He just didn't believe that he was God. But he did believe he was the Messiah. He was an adoptionist that believed he had been adopted by God. And so... He was fascinated, and as he looked at them and put these inscriptions there, and look at the Dome of the Rock, and look at the coins, and look at the protocols. He was still a Christian, and even when he wrote the word Muhammad, Muhammad Rasulullah, there on the Dome of the Rock, he was referring to Jesus. He was referring to Jesus, not to a man named Muhammad. There was no man named Muhammad in 692 that we know of that lived in Mecca or Medina. Remember, the Dome of the Rock is in Jerusalem, a thousand miles further north. Now, once you introduce the Arabic text and you put it on the coins, once you put it on the coins, and he made it make by 696, all the coins were Arabic. They were all Arabic. 
Before that, they had been Greek, they had been Aramaic, they had been other languages, even Pahlavi or uh, Zora, uh, uh, Persian. But by the time he then introduces and eradicates all the other languages and introduces Arabic as the lingua franca for the whole empire, by the time they realized that they needed to get the Quran together, the, most of the people did not really know much Aramaic. And certainly those who were in charge of then borrowing all these, because once you need to put a Quran, you need to borrow. And what you borrow, you borrow what already exists. The problem was what already existed were almost either in Aramaic or in Hebrew. Syriac Aramaic, Nabataean Aramaic, and Hebrew at that time. And when you take the Aramaic and you don't know what it is to begin with, you've got to find, and you put it into Arabic, you've got to basically guess. And when you guess, you then realize that in order to understand it, you've got to have ways of understanding the words you're looking at. So you start adding dots to it. These are called diacritical marks. These are called haraka. Any job. Now, when did that happen? Well, that happened from 736. That's this right here. But before that, you had the manuscripts that your the manuscript were starting to be written, but the manuscripts were all written without any harakat. They were written without any dots and vowels. They were just razum. They were consonantal texts. They were Arabic, and they were, had been borrowed from all these different sources. That's why when you look at the Quran, it's uta puta all over the way. There is no chronology. There is no, really, there's no rhyme or reason. They jump from story to story. They don't have any, there's no sense or uh, in fact, the most of the stories don't begin, the stories don't end. There's no transitional phrases to help you from story to story. They jump all over the place and they leave you confused and they assume the reader knows what the stories are about. Well, many times those people did know what the story is about in the Aramaic uh, because they had grown up with them in their Christian churches. So when you start putting the Quran together, I hope Amin is listening and I hope the rest of you are listening. When you put the Quran together, you need to then put your dots where you want to. And if you, Al-Fadi, put your dots where you want to, and I come along and put my dots where I want to, and then someone else comes along and puts their dots, and then someone else, and different cities then have different rules and have different ways of interpreting. You, there are so many different ways of putting dots on a word, and if you put a dots on a word, it changes the sentence. If it changes the sentence, it changes the verse. So that's why suddenly these all start proliferating. And according to Nasr, Shadi Nasr, there could have been as many as 700 of these different Qurans. It became such a dilemma that by the 10th century in 936, Ibn Mujahid had to choose just seven. Seven then were then enlarged to another 21 by al Shatibi in 1194, then need to be enlarged by another nine by al Jazari in 1420, 14, what is it? 1429. Goodness sakes, that is the 15th century. By that time, there are 30 different Qurans with all different dots, different vowels, 93,000 differences between them. This was such a dilemma that in 1924, they then had to bring it down to one. And that was the Hafs Quran that had been written in 796. That's the late 8th century. So can you see from the Aramaic, it then had to be put into the Arabic, but those who put it into Arabic didn't know by the time they were writing it up, they didn't understand the Aramaic. And that's why they had to guess and they had to manipulate and they had to choose. And you had different choices and you had different texts that were popular in Kufa, other texts that were popular in Damascus, another text that was popular way over uh, in the West, uh, over in Cairo, and then you had about another popular in Mecca and Medina. You had five different cities where these texts became popular. Three of them in the north, two of them in the south. By the end of the 8th century, by the 10th century, they then had to do the choosing. Well, can you see? That's what happened. Once you adulterate the text, you can pretty much decide where you want to go with the text. So the Quran we have today, this book that we have today, is an Abbasid Quran. Abbasids came to, into, into power in the mid-8th century. They took the capital from Damascus brought it to Stesiphon, which they then be, uh, named Baghdad. And then from the 8th, 9th, and 10th century, they started putting the Quran together. All from these lectionaries, from these hymns, from these sermons, all about Jesus. And what did they do? They got rid of Jesus. And every time you see Rasul, that should be Jesus. And that which was beautiful, they adulterated. And in some cases, bastardize. And that's why we need to bring them home. We need to take them back to the original text. We need them take them back to the original hymns.
basically, we need to take him back to Jesus. And isn't Amen. that what we've been doing, Al-Fari? Isn't that what you've been doing in your whole ministry? Mm -hmm. That's what I've been doing for 40 years. But thank yeah. God for the Germans. Thank God for what they're finding. Thank God for what we're now exposing. Now, what's happened in the last few months because of Thomas Alexander, two well-known scholars, especially one, one well-known scholar. I'm not going to introduce him yet because he's going to be coming on my channel. We'll be doing it in a, in a few weeks. He is one of the leading scholars in Germany, has been looking at our videos. He has saying, you have got it right. God bless Thomas Alexander, who is representing us. You have done an amazing job on your channel, Jay. You have got everything we have been saying, but you don't have the newest material. I would like to help you out. So he's going to come. I'm not going to give you his name yet because I haven't introduced him yet. You'll recognize him. You know who he is. He yeah, I, I know which ones, but I'm not going to talk about it publicly. I talked about, so. him, about him earlier today, and he's bringing another, one of the best scholars, two of the best scholars from Germany are going to come on Fander Films, and we're going to start looking at the newer material. Because, see, the Germans don't stop. They just go blazing straight ahead. But can you see what they have found? Everything we know about Islam, everything we know about Muhammad, everything we know about Mecca, and everything we now know about the Quran is now in doubt. And it's in doubt because we are not trusting the 9th and 10th and 11th century traditions anymore, the standard Islamic narrative. We are now going back to the 7th century. And when you go back to the 7th century, that which was beautiful has been adulterated. And we want to get it back to its beauty again. We want to bring it home. What better way than to bring it home? So I am always fascinated by um, crime shows. And in crime shows, there is always a crime. And initially, you make assumptions that this person is a suspect or this person could be uh, the killer. But then at the end of the day, you discover that it was a completely different person. Why? Because you follow the evidence. And that's what we're doing. Islam as we know it, following the standard Islamic narrative, have killed millions upon millions upon millions by sending them to hell rather than sending them to paradise. And now we are uncovering a lot of evidence, I mean piles upon piles upon piles of evidence that point to something completely different than Mecca, than the Arabic language of the Quran, than the person of the prophet of Islam. And we are, you know, basically following the evidence. And that's what you're doing. That's why I like to bring you here. That's why I'm going to bring even some of the other gentlemen that you'll be bringing in your show. Because we want to point Amina and others to the right location. And that's pointing back to Christ. Everything. I mean, there is a reason, by the way, why John of Damascus called Islam a Christian cult a heresy the guy lived at that time he can yeah. see that there is something about islam that deviated from the uh, straight path just another cult wanted to make a name for itself so we need to bring people like you said back home and i want to address amina right now she's saying that she is concerned about coming to christ coming home because people told her that she's going to go to hell well amina let me tell you this amina are you worried about what people say or are you worried about what the true God is going to do? Do you believe people who know nothing basically about their own salvation? By the way, those people, I assume they're Muslims. Do you know that Muhammad himself didn't know where is he going, nor what's going to happen to those who are following him? Chapter 48 of the Quran, verse 9. So Amina, today the scripture says, our scripture, the Holy Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Our scripture says, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Our scripture says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are saved. Because anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So that's my invitation to you. Uh, today is the day of salvation. No one can at all, at all, assure himself of even one more second of living. I can tell you this much, Amina, and I don't want to scare you. But four people that I was so close to, within a span of one month, they all went to be with the Lord just like that. And they're all young, by the way. They're not old. 
They didn't have cancer or anything like that. One, COVID, and two, just sudden heart attacks. And they didn't have a time to say goodbye to their family. But you know what's the common denominator of these four? They all know the Lord. So I'm going to see him one day. We're all going to see them, and we're going to be in the company of the Lord. So this is my invitation to you, Amina. If you're really sincerely seeking truth, today is the day. You pray right now, and you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and he will take care of you. Yeah, that's if you sincerely seek in to be with the Lord. Brother, I'll, I'll give you the last word. Yeah, I think as we're peeling back layer by layer the historical difficulties with Islam, as we peel back, in this case tonight, we were looking at the Quran. Tomorrow we'll be looking at Muhammad himself. The day after we'll be unpacking what we do with Mecca. As we're peeling back each one of these layers, I... I expect us to find many Aminas. The first problem and the first thing that most Muslims do is they start to get disillusioned. And that's understandable because everything they have been told is now imploding. Because if it doesn't stand up to history, if the Quran, everything they have been told is from the wrong place with the wrong man at the wrong time. And that actually almost everything that they know about their Quran is turn, turn, turning out to be a fraud. That will start the disillusionment there. And I think Amina is at that place right now. But see, people like Amina also need to know, well, and where can they go? And this is the beauty of what we do. I don't want to, de to destroy people's faith. That's not what I'm about. I want to bring them home. I want to bring them from Allah back to Yahweh. I want to take them from the Quran and bring them back to the Bible. I want to take them from Issa and bring them back to Yeshua. Because Muslims more than any other, and listen, I've been working with Muslims for 40 years now. Muslims more than any other people that I have met. They understand. They have such a beautiful faith. They have such an amazing faith. They do know there is a God. I don't have to convince them that that's not what our discussions are. They know what sin's about. They know what salvation, but they've got the wrong salvation. They've got the wrong definition of sin, and they've got the wrong definition of God. And they certainly, though they talk and they give lip service to Issa, they don't even know who Jesus is or how beautiful he was and how and what he came to do. He came to die on the cross. He came to die on the cross and rise again for Amina and for me and for everybody. Those of us who have been looking and waiting for someone that we can follow, who've been looking and waiting for someone that really is worthy to follow. Well, Amina, his name is Jesus. He's there. He's been there for the last 2,000 years. When we, we're not about disillusioning people. We're about bringing them back to a, found, a firmer foundation. The only foundation that is, as, that is as firm as you can get is that of Jesus Christ. What he did on the cross 2,000 years ago, the fact that he died for us, the fact that he rose again on the third day, destroyed death so that we can be living and walking and talking with him for eternity. I don't want a heaven where there's women wine and song. That doesn't get me excited. Sorry, women. There's nothing against women. I have a beautiful wife and I have kids and I love my wife. That is not what I'm waiting for. I want to be with Jesus again. I want to be walking and talking with him like Adam and Eve were talking and walking with him at the very beginning. I want that. I want to be in his presence again. I want to get home again, and I can't wait. Don't have to get me there any quicker than I have to, but can you see that is what Jesus has promised. That's what he's always promised. And all of this material, some, all these exercises, this textual criticism that we've done tonight, that's all been applied to the Bible. And the Bible is the only book that has passed every test. The person of Jesus Christ, the historical, not the curse of faith, the Christ of history, did live 2,000 years ago, did die at 33 AD and rose again. And the fact that he died and rose again, I know that I am saved. I know that my sins are taken care of, and I know that I'm going to be with him. And I want to make sure you're with us as well. I mean, I want to see you in heaven as well. The only way you can do that is to admit what he did for you 2,000 years ago. God bless you. It's been great being with you, Al-Fadi. Uh, these are the kind of talks I do love to go. It's good that you got us on board because these are the kind of talks that actually answer the question for not just for Christians and Muslims. Also, we're finding atheists and humanists. They like that we're doing this because we're speaking their language. We're speaking their language in that we're asking the not what our testimony is, but is it true? That's what we're trying to answer. Is it true? 
But whereas the humanists and the atheists, I don't mind them using this material. They have no response. They have no alternative. They have no antidote. They have no answer. And for them, all they care about is shutting down the Quran and shutting down Muhammad. I don't want to do that. I want to give them an alternative. I want to bring them home. I don't want to shut down the Quran if I don't give them the Bible. I don't want to shut down Isa if I don't give them Yeshua. And I don't want to shut down Allah if I don't give them Yahweh. Bring them home to God. Bring them home to the true, the only God there is. And he's a God that's going to wait for you. He is there waiting for you to walk and talk with him in the cool of the day, face to face. Amen, Amen brother. It's always a privilege, of course, to have you here, brother. And I would love really to do uh, these type of uh, shows with you more often. And, uh, uh, and I told people that our job here in our channel is to showcase the work that is being done in other channels and your work is very important and i believe in it brother that's why i always bring you not just here but also to our studios because it deserves uh, to be known and i told you i've been asked a couple of times already to use your material to do it in arabic and i know you've been gracious to give me permission to do so and that shows you how important the work is that it's starting to get noticed and others are paying attention to. For instance, I've used some of the material from Dr. Brubaker's uh, own uh, book about corrections. I did it in Arabic and it's going like wildfire already. Our videos are starting to be way at the top. So I would love now to start using some of your material. Uh, we'll definitely give credit. We'll use even your slides the way they look so people know where it's coming from because we want them to know that, yes, indeed, Coming home is not following the path of Islam, but following Christ himself. Isn't it ironic, Jay, that our Muslim friends always say, well, how come the Gospels are not written in Aramaic because Jesus spoke Aramaic? Well, guess what? The Quran now has Aramaic roots. What an irony, indeed. <laughs> Thanks, well, well, buddy. Amen. In the last hour, we had people from South America, North America. We had people from Ethiopia, from Chad. We have people from Nigeria, we have people from Philippine, by the way, among any other uh, other countries as well. We have someone who is Colombian and Yemeni at the same time, so I don't know where he is living right now, but it's interesting. And we have Amina, of course. Uh, we are going to continue to pray for her that she gets the courage. Amina, we get it that you are concerned for your safety. I'm not trying to downplay that at all. But the beauty about our Lord is that you can believe in your heart and the Holy Spirit will be in you and the Lord will open the right doors for you to share and be a witness to your family. So um, again, it's all about a personal relationship with the Lord and this is your chance. And we pray that you will take the courage to do so. Reach out to me, reach out to Jay. By the way, you can reach out to me through my website, sirainternational.com or through our YouTube channel. Same thing with Jay, Finder Films. And uh, you can also reach out to me at least through uh, Facebook if you like. Uh, we like to know how we can uh, be of help to you and uh, we will continue to pray for you. Brother, thank you so much as always. Uh, is there anything uh, special you want to share with people about upcoming videos, upcoming things that you're doing? Uh, well, we're starting a whole brand new, yeah, we're starting a whole brand new course on Monday on just this material. We're looking at both the Bible and looking at the Quran on our MAPI course. And if anybody is interested, they just need to write info at ves.edu info at ves.edu and register but you need to register before monday monday night uh this will be a eight week course it's at a master's level or you can do it as an audit or you can do it as a personal enrichment student uh it's at monday nights from eight o'clock to ten o'clock eastern time uh, not uh, where you are. And so that's why it's 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 meant for people. You do it. It's done by Zoom webinar. So you just sit in the comfort of your own home. You don't have to leave your home to take this course. It is starting on Monday and it'll go for eight weeks. So this will be all on this new material that I were introducing. Looking at the Bible, that will be done by Dr. Da Daniel Janasik and I'll be doing the Quranic part. So we're doing co-teaching it uh, for every week for eight weeks. Wonderful, brother. And I encourage everyone uh, really to consider at least at least auditing uh, these courses because uh, I can tell you this is a unique program. I'm not aware of really any uh, other, um, uh, I should say, academic program that is offering something similar to this. So you might want to just at least audit it and uh, hopefully uh, you will consider uh, getting the full degree. Uh, obviously, uh, I'm not here to qualify you, but I'm saying on it alone will give you access to material and you'll be able to, of course, benefit from it. Thank you, brother. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our moderators. Thank you for everyone who's joining us here. 
This is Alfadi. God bless you.